operating with a growth mindset to better serve all of our stakeholders. With relationships as one of our core values, we seek to create a community of trust. We value your input and want you to know that it has not gone unheard. The following are just a few of the changes we have made as a result of your feedback from last year's Comprehensive Needs Assessment Survey. Our child nutrition team has launched a new Facebook page to share its dining experiences, and they've increased food selections by over 400 additional items. We are providing more professional training for school safety and campus enforcement officers. We have also purchased a new walkthrough metal detector to replace old units and have begun to install door alarms that will alert building staff anytime an exterior door is open. We have invested more than $10 million in bond funding to upgrade our athletic facilities. This includes new artificial turf, locker rooms, and a parking lot at Hughes Field. The Forest Hill High School Gymnasium received new flooring, seating, a scoreboard, and bleachers. Callaway's and Jim Hill's gymnasiums also received new flooring, seating, and restroom renovations. We're targeting support to English language learners by hosting a series of parent forums throughout the school year. We've also hired more ELL staff and expanded our programs in high schools. We have secured a $2.7 million grant to improve mental health outcomes and academic achievement for our scholars. These resources will help us increase our school staff of professional psychologists for early detection and treatment of mental health issues. We've also launched a robust district-wide after-school program with ESER funding to achieve better outcomes for nearly 4,000 scholars with high quality tutoring and reading and math and activities in performing arts and music. We've also enhanced summer learning and enrichment programs. Our exceptional education program has made itself more visible by hosting after hour events to inform parents about the eligibility process and services we offer for scholars with special needs. And finally, to further our strategic commitment to creating joyful learning environments, we have launched a school climate report card for each JPS school called Thrive. This report card is now available online and uses data that you provide in the Comprehensive Needs Assessment Survey. Each school's Thrive report provides a comparison to the overall district performance and to various school demographic groups, including scholars, staff, and family. Our school leaders are using Thrive to inform school climate goal setting and improvement efforts. By completing the Comprehensive Needs Assessment Survey, you have already helped to make more informed and strategic decisions that impact our scholars and families. We look forward to hearing from even more of you with this year's survey. Your voice is critical to our continued success. And together, we'll ensure that our scholars and families receive the educational services that they need and deserve. The Jackson Public School District held a luncheon at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum to celebrate National School Counseling Week and to honor school counselors here at home. The event kicked off with the Jim Hill High School Concert Choir giving a magnificent performance. The choir set the tone for a day of celebration and recognition as Jackson Public School District's hardworking and dedicated school counselors were honored. JPS administrative leaders praised school counselors for the vital role they play in the lives of scholars. We know that our counselors are needed. You are needed. You have an important role in our schools every day. 
So much of your hard work is focused on the successes of the scholars and the team around them. Dr. King once remarked, what self-centered men and women have torn down, men and women other-centered must build up. And that is what you do. You orient yourself to the care and the concern of others so that they might be built up. And we in Jackson Public Schools just want to say thank you. Along with words of encouragement, a musical performance that inspired and uplifted. To dream the impossible dream. To fight the unbeatable foe. Finally, the moment everyone had been waiting for arrived as the Jackson Public School Counselor of the Year was announced. Congratulations, 10th grade counselor Carmen Taylor of Callaway High School. Honored for her unwavering commitment to the success of scholars. I was not expecting this. I love my job. Like I, and I hope y'all can see it, can tell from how I am, how I interact. But thank you. Thank you. The event was a testament to the vital role that all JPS school counselors play in the lives of our scholars. Operation Warm Shoes sponsored by FedEx and they're coming to bring all of our pre-K through second grade scholars brand new shoes. They're sizing them for their current feet size um, and we're getting them walking away here with some school supplies and some happy um, that they can take home this evening. Today uh, we're partnered, FedEx Ground and, and FedEx Corporation, we're partnered with Operation Warm to provide uh, new shoes to the students here at Pecan Park Elementary. Uh, Operation Warm and FedEx have been working together for several years now, um, and this year in the, in the months of March and April, we're, we're giving away over 8,000 pairs of shoes to students in 28 different cities in North America, including Canada and, and Puerto Rico. It means that we are truly buying into our vision here at Pecan Park, which is educating a total child. So we're feeding into their social emotional well-being, making sure that our students are walking away with the confidence that they're needing to be successful, not just in school instructionally, but throughout life. One of our core values is commit to do good. And that's what we're striving to do is, is help build a strong, healthy relationship between FedEx and the communities where our... Are y'all ready? Okay. Okay, I'll make, I'll make sure to uh, I'll make that announcement. Good evening. The Jackson Public School Board meeting is now called to order. Board members, we have six members present. Uh, we have four here in the boardroom, and then Mrs. Johnson and Ms. Hilliard are on the phone. Mr. Figures is on his way, and he'll be here uh, momentarily. Therefore, we have a quorum. Uh, we have all had an opportunity to review the agenda. Is there a motion to adopt the agenda as presented? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have an opportunity to review the minutes. Is there a motion to approve the April 4th, 2023 regular board meeting minutes? So moved. Second. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Dr. Luckett has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. And with that, Dr. Green, superintendent's report. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. Good evening, board members, uh, to our team members, and all of our community members who are with us this uh, evening or, or listening uh, via live stream. We'll begin, as we typically do, with our um, video presentation from the instructional television team.
JPS students learned about options for higher education at the recent junior college fair. We want all of the scholars, the best and brightest, to come to the Jackson State University. The fair was an excellent opportunity for students to meet with college recruiters and ask questions about their future education plans. Representatives from several colleges were in attendance, providing information about the application process, financial aid options, and the various programs and degrees available. We have the senior college fair in the fall, and we get our juniors ready in the spring. JPS Elementary Musical Talent was on full display at the All City Musical Festival. The festival showcased the musical talents of local students in a performance called Rhapsody in Blues and Jazz. Anyone who has put on any kind of production, you know that it takes a ton of time, lots of planning, lots of hard work to bring all these pieces together. The festival included a variety of performances, including singing, dancing, and instrumental music. Scholars demonstrated an incredible amount of talent and dedication with their hard work and practice evident in every performance. Get ready for a summer of fun and learning with the JPS A3 Summer Enrichment Camp starting June 5th and running Monday through Friday until June 30th. This exciting opportunity is available for all JPS scholars, pre-K through 12th grade. Camps will be offered at multiple school sites at convenient times for elementary, middle, and high school scholars. The A3 Summer Camp is an enrichment, not remediation program. Students will be given a jump start with early exposure to learning standards that will be taught the upcoming school year. Your child will have the chance to try a new skill, to explore engaging activities, and the best part? This summer camp is completely free for all JPS scholars. Breakfast, lunch, and transportation are provided so your scholar can focus on learning and having fun. Don't miss out on this great opportunity. Register your scholar now by scanning the QR code on the screen or contact the JPS Office of Innovative Strategy for more information. The JPS A3 Summer Enrichment Camp where learning and fun come together. For more information about Jackson Public Schools, please visit our website at jackson.k12.ms.us. Follow us on Facebook at Jackson Public Schools, on Twitter at JPS District, Comcast Channels 18 and 19, and YouTube at youtube.com slash jpsitv. Thank you to our instructional television team. Uh, board members, tonight I'm excited to introduce to you um, and the listening audience the JTEX mock trial team, the dream team. They recently participated in the Magnolia Bar Association mock trial on March the 10th and 11th and placed as a uh, silver medalist. Uh, at this time, I want to uh, invite JTEC principal, Ms. Ashley Molden, um, up to the podium, and she will tell us more about the mock trial and introduce these fantastic scholars. Principal Molden. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I am pleased to have the opportunity to present the first ever JPS Tougaloo Early College High School Program mock trial team. Our mock trial team comprised of scholars representing both Murrah and Jim Hill High Schools competed in their first ever Magnolia Bar mock trial competition on March 10th through the 11th. After practicing for only three short weeks, the Dream Team, as they are affectionately referred to, won second place overall in the competition, only losing by one point. Our team is under the leadership of supervising attorney and JTEX ninth grade parent, attorney Gayla Carpenter Sanders, and JTEX alumnus, Ms. Marquita Shell, who is a current history major at Tougaloo College. Please help me celebrate the members of our dream team as I ask them to come forward to receive their certificates. Ms. Anna Martin, who is a ninth grader. Mr. Nicholas Seebeck, who is also a ninth grader. Miss okay. no. <laughs> Nackenzie Tillis, who is a ninth grader. Okay. 
Mr. Charles Williams, who is a current 11th grader at JTIC. <laughs> Other members of the Dream Team who are not present with us tonight are Ariana and Ariel Brumfield, Kaita Welchlin. Um, I would be remiss not to recognize um, the individuals who I spoke about earlier. The Dream Team was really the brainchild of our parent, Attorney Gayla Carpenter Sanders, and I would ask that she join us. Mm -hmm. And also our alumnus, Miss Marquita Shell, who was the first ever Miss J. Tix. We also have to celebrate the JTEX parents who helped to make sure that this was possible. Like I mentioned, this was a heavy lift that we started on kind of um, at the last minute as we prepared students for competition, but the students rose to the occasion with the support of their parents. So we are really grateful for you all too, and if you all would stand, that would be great. Thank you all so much. <laughs> it's wonderful. I So much good stuff happening all across Jackson Public Schools. Thank you so much for uh, to Principal Moden and to the entire JTEX uh, family, to our parents, all of those who are supporting the mock trial team, the dream team. Um, I'm told that uh, you're going to bring home the gold medal. Is that the plan for next year? Okay. All right. Awesome. We'll be here. We'll be looking forward to it. Uh, kudos again. Let's give them another round of applause. Um, and that concludes all of my remarks this evening. Um, Dr. Sivak, did you, did you want to say anything about the mock trial team? <laughs> just wondered. <laughs> um, I, I do want to just uh, shout out uh, to Principal Molden for making the space for the team to happen. Um, and Ms. Carpenter Sanders, you know, she doesn't have a student, she has a student at JTEX, but not on the team. So in addition to also being, you know, very involved with the Murrah soccer team, she also found time to, to sponsor this team. And so I just want to thank you for investing in our students as well. <laughs> thank you, sir. I won't embarrass the son and the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, thank you. Um, so we'll continue to, uh, with our meeting now. Um, the, the JTEX folks, y'all are welcome to stay. You don't have to stay, but obviously it's an open meeting. Now's a, a good break in time if, if y'all have other things to do. Um, but again, you're welcome to stay. Um, next, we will move on to uh, public comment. Um, community members who would like to make comments should email their request to Ms. Rosalind Williams at jackson.k12.ms.us no later than 4 p.m. the day of the meeting or appear in person in the boardroom no later than 5.15 the day of the meeting. Um, we do have two comments this evening, board members. Uh, so before I get started, just want to set the expectations. Of, of course, there will be three minutes for comments. Attorney Turner generally keeps the minutes. Uh, and um, she will also keep the time. Uh, the board believes the public comment is very important and we will listen and consider comments. Uh, however, we will not respond at this time. If there is an issue that has not been taken up with leadership at a particular school or with district administration, we certainly encourage commenters to do so. Um, and all board members can be reached via our email addresses, which are on the JPS website. Attorney Turner. Board members, you have two persons who've signed up to address you this evening. The first is Darlene Lomax, who'd like to address you regarding schools. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Darlene Lomax, and I'm with uh, Preserving and Improving JPS. So what we are concerned with are the closed schools. So we have four points here. One, uh, on December 2022, you all had a meeting uh, at Galloway. 
and your superintendent green i was on my way out made a statement to me that he would get back with me and we would discuss it after the holidays but i never did hear back from superintendent green secretary collin told me that everything was full for january they'll get back with me but they never did so i look forward to that meeting until this day we haven't had it Second, we would like to see those closed schools merge with some of the schools that are already open. So therefore, we will not have closed schools, hopefully. Third, we would like to see Sywell Middle School become a VOTEC school, a vocational school for all interested students. Fourth, we would like to see any one of the closed schools become a fire academy for those students who might be interested in becoming a firefighter. So I talked to Chief Owens, and he thought it was a great idea, and he said if anyone needs to contact him, he's with the city of Jackson, and you know, you, we, are, we can go from there. Okay, next is my telephone number. Uh, my telephone number is 601-955-6911. I stress that because on Wednesday nights, I am on the radio with some other people. And some of you have called in and, um, and I have, they have something there so we'll know who's calling, okay? So if it's a question that you would like to ask me, uh, my telephone number that you can call and ask me if you don't wanna ask it on air is 601. 955-6911, and I'm all for public schools. I am a product of Jackson Public Schools and the city of Jackson, Mississippi, as well as uh, Smith Robinson, Rowan, Lanier, Jackson State, Valley State, back to Jackson State. Mm -hmm. So I am concerned about our surroundings here in the city of Jackson for our students to be better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lomax. Next, Mr. Uh, I believe Baba Lakata, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, would like to address you also regarding schools. Good evening. Good evening. We know that Fannie Lou Hamer was denied an opportunity to get a, fo a formal education. She. Uh, she did uh, three months per year in education because at that time, the agricultural industry was the, the, uh, the way that our children were encouraged to uh, seek employment and to be busy. We know that today, uh, technology and vocation is the future for our students. We would hope that Jackson Public Schools would make opportunity for our students to have a higher uh, opportunity to uh, engage in vocational education as well as technical education. So we would hope that we would begin to use perhaps some of the closed schools to create a school specifically for vocational and technological uh, training for our students, particularly those who uh, we know over the years did not complete uh, their formal education with Jackson Public Schools. When we, begin to, when we begin to look at the crisis that we have, crises that we have in our community, if we can find ways to give our children hope through increased intellectual capacity, then we have better opportunity to, to uh, reduce some of those crises. So we sincerely hope that uh, Jackson Public School would find a way to increase vocational and technical education for its current student, students as well as those who didn't get an opportunity to finish their formal education. Thank you for your time. Thank you. All right. Okay. Um, again, thank you for all of the comments shared this evening. Um, we will next move on to our information only items, a review of school improvement benchmark results uh, for identified schools. This will be Dr. McDonald's, our school Office of School Support Manager, will share, share this information.
Good evening. Good evening. Dr. Sevak, board members, Dr. Green, and the JPS family. The Jackson Public School District Office of School Support presents for information purposes only school improvement updates for schools that are identified as Comprehensive Support and Improvement, CSI, Additional Targeted Support and Improvement, ATSI, Targeted Support and Improvement, TSI, and Schools at Risk, SAR. Captured in each report, you will find the overall school proficiency goals, benchmark assessment proficiency results, student enrollment and attendance data, disciplinary infractions are also included. Schools will then detail next steps to address areas of challenge presented by the data, and district supports will also be highlighted in the report. At this time, do you have any questions about the reports presented for your identified schools? Thank you, Dr. McDonald. Board members, any questions? I do have a few questions. Yes, sir. Um, so the first was um, around people's middle school. Um, the, the the benchmark showed significant progress, particularly in the area of, of the reading assessment. Um, Sixty two, which is you know for our middle schools, that's that's really that's really strong. Um, wanted to understand: is that a cumulative? Is that just for that one benchmark test, or is that through the third benchmark? All the material provided up through the third benchmark. Dr. Seabag, I'll ask Dr. Greger to respond to that. Okay. Good evening. Good, evening. Good evening, everyone. Yes, it is cumulative. Uh, the reading assessments are cumulative, so um, it's just, you know, uh, that culmination of uh, those, uh, you know, that 62 does represent that. And it is sustainable. I did see your question about mm -hmm. is that sustainable. It is sustainable as long as some of the same uh, strategies are continuously implemented with fidelity, that 62 should be sustainable. And so what do we need to do? So if we had 62, again, and I know we're, that's just at the third benchmark. There's continuing instruction on between now and the testing date. What, what do we need to do across the middle school um, system to, to get that level of, of achievement? Right. That's a really good question. Well, some of the things that we've noticed uh, at people's middle schools uh, is consistency. They consistently use the uh, district curriculum, which is study sync. Uh, they took full advantage of this built-in block of time that we have on B-Days called extended learning time. Mm -hmm. uh, they practice consistently with do nows and exit tickets as well to uh, further, uh, you know, check for student understanding as well. So just some consistency pieces across the board has really helped them be able to uh, have that sustainability. Also, um, they did not have a lot of turnover as far as, you know, teachers are concerned as well. So that consistency in that area also helped out and, and played a part. Okay. No, thank you for that. Um, again, that was the main thing. It was, it, was, it was great to see that progress and just wanted to see, again, how we could find ways to replicate it across the system. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next we have the benchmark three data presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Blackshear, uh, our director of planning and evaluation, will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. So, good evening, uh, board president Dr. Sevak, board members, superintendent Dr. Green. JPS family and friends. So tonight I have the pleasure of sharing with you a high level overview of our benchmark three data. We'll discuss where we are in terms of um, proficiency, our current levels of proficiency. We'll do a little comparison of our benchmark one bench to benchmark two, benchmark three, as well as uh, review our state data from last year as well. Last but not least, We'll discuss some next steps, discuss the last push before to obtaining that B. So before we uh, dive into our third through 12th grade data, we want to remind everyone that we're not only focused on our tested subjects, 
We're also committed to building a strong foundation in grades K to two, okay? So you'll see here, captured on this slide, where we've compared benchmark two to benchmark three, and then we also compared benchmark three this year to benchmark three last year, okay? You actually see where we saw a slight increase in kindergarten and first grade from benchmark two to benchmark three um, in first grade as well. And then second grade, we saw a decrease from benchmark two to benchmark three. And I'm sure you're wondering why the stars, the Ghostbusters, and all those <laughs> things as well. So we wanted to dive a little bit deeper. So we looked at the kindergartners that were last year's kindergartner with the 66% proficient. They are now this year's first graders. So we wanted to know um, in terms of why our scholars, as they transition from grade level to grade level, we have a decrease in proficiency. So we're, again, we're committed to building a strong foundation, diving in to determine what are some of those causes. Again, as well, you'll see the math is uh, in that same type of format. We looked at from benchmark two to benchmark three. Then we compare benchmark three uh, last year to this year as well. Again, we saw a, a slight decrease in our kindergarten benchmark data. We saw an increase in first grade as well as our second grade. And then if you look at our second grade data for um, last year, we were sitting at around about 25% proficient Whereas this year's third graders, they are this year's third graders, they are right at 28%. And again, we want to make sure that we know that our third graders this year were our pandemic babies in kindergarten as well. So we're proud of the rebound um, that we're seeing. Okay. Now, let's go a little bit further and let's discuss our grades three through 12. Here are overall, this slide captures our overall proficiency from benchmark one, two, and three, our goal as a district is to increase the amount of scholars scoring proficient after each benchmark. And we are so proud to see that benchmark one and two, across the board, we saw an increase from two to three. We saw an increase in all of our subjects as well, except for uh, U.S. history saw a slight decrease. This slide captures our benchmark three um, last year to benchmark three this year, but we also wanted to couple it or put it alongside our uh, ambitions, our stretch targets that we put in place to obtain this year. And again, we're excited to see that we saw an increase in all of our subject areas um, with science having the highest increase. And I know that um, we, in a response to a question that we had was, was that science assessment cumulative? It was all of our benchmark threes are cumulative assessments. Here you actually see, we began testing our third graders last week, the third grade reading summative assessment. We wanted to review and kind of analyze that data as well. We saw an increase in terms of proficiency, a um, little over 6%. We compared it again to last year's, and I want to make sure that we see uh, last year benchmark we had 25% of our students to be proficient, 47% of our students to meet the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. However, in our first administration, we actually yielded a little over 60%. So if that trend continues, we'll see an increase of our first administration passage rate as well. So we're excited about that. This is the first time we're actually excited to see a decrease in where we should, which is those that not meeting the Literacy-Based Promotion Act. We want to see a decrease in that. Mm -hmm. okay. So let's look at our proficiency by grade level. So as you can see, again, we've increased the proficiency uh, by grade level in all subjects. If you look at third grade, this time last year, we were sitting at 25% proficient, but we compared it to our MAP, our state assessment on last year. So we went from 25 in on the benchmark three, but actually on the MAP assessment, we had 34% of our scholars to be proficient. So I do want to highlight the fact that we were ahead of uh, all of our MAP assessment except for fourth grade, and we're watching 
um, that grade level as well. Our secondary, we saw an increase as well. Again, if you look at seventh grade, last year we were at 21 percent, but on the map we actually had 24 percent. So we're excited about the way the data is projected or trending. Our current level of proficiency, again, our goal is to decrease the amount of scholars in levels one, two, and three as we progress. Uh, between uh, benchmarks, so we saw a decrease in level one, we saw a decrease in level two in terms of uh, proficiency, and we're pushing them to level three, fours, and fives where we want our scholars to be. Our mathematics, in grades three, four, and five, again, we saw an increase as we, from last year's benchmark to this year's benchmark, we are ahead of our uh, targets in all of our areas except for fourth grade, a little shy. And again, we are ahead of all of our state assessment from last year as well. So we're excited about that. Secondary. So we actually see we took a decrease in second grade, I mean sixth grade, excuse me, from this time last year to this year. We saw an increase in seventh grade and a slight decrease in our eighth grade. And one of the questions that were posed to us is, why do we see the decrease um, in sixth grade over a year? What accounts for that? And after definitely speaking with principals and um, the assistant superintendent, we noticed that there are new teachers to that grade and vacancies in that particular grade level as well. Uh, we also noticed that there were several standards that posed challenges for our sixth graders in the second benchmark and the third benchmark as well, which um, made our teachers to get behind in pacing. So we had a lot of unfinished learning there as well. So our middle school and high school algebra data, we saw an increase again in all of our areas just shy from our targets. Our mathematics proficiency levels, again, we are, our schools are doing a great job decreasing the amount of scholars that are in level one from benchmark two, one, two, and three. We pushed them to level two, then pushing them to three, and we've increased the amount of scholars in level four and level five. So our overall proficiency, as you see, is 24%. Our Science, biology. Here we saw an increase from this time last year compared to this time last year to this year. Uh, we saw a decrease in our science. And again, we're right there um, in line with our map from last year and with biology one seeing the highest increase in terms of proficiency. Our science levels. We have a considerable amount of our scholars that are residing in the level three, so we're working to decrease those level threes again, pushing them to level fours and five, because that is our goal, growing all of our students towards proficiency. Last but not least, our history data. Again, uh, we are very excited about our data. We show growth in almost every one of our subjects, including U.S. history just shy of our target, of course, and then just shy of our map, map assessment, our state assessment as well. Here gives you a quick overview of uh, where our students are residing. Again, our goal is to decrease the amount of scholars in level one and twos and threes and push them towards proficiency. So we see a high number of our scholars that are residing in that three and our goal over the next couple of weeks is to push them to fours and fives. So our roadmap to a B. So what are some of our next steps is our superintendents and the curriculum department, Office of Teaching and Learning are working with those schools to determine how close are they from their goal. 
We're looking at who are those students that need additional support, what are those standards, what are those subjects that we need to focus on that's keeping us from missing our, um, hitting our mark. Um, how often are we providing those tutorials? So having a very succinct plan. How often, how we're going to progress monitor it, what resources we're going to use. We want to ensure that all of our scholars take the MAP assessment because it's very important that we hit the 95%. We're also looking at um, some of our schools and others are joining in to offer sincerity tutorials. Um, and some of the things that we are planning for next year, we have some teachers that we've identified that have been consistently low performing. What are we going to do differently to support those teachers and get them on the right track? We're looking at our coaches that are um, providing additional support in those middle schools, discussing our expectations of our K-2 teachers, um, making sure we have a tighter district testing plan to ensure accurate data, Again, ensuring all of our scholars take the benchmark assessment, providing a number of training, including to our SPED teachers, and then discussing how we can continue to improve our after schools. And I think I want to go ahead, too, and address one of the questions that were posed. The question said, how will growth affect rating this year? Mm -hmm. um, and if we achieve the proficiency target set in the presentation, do we need growth levels similar to levels achieved last year to obtain a higher um, rating? And we will. So if we hit the targets in the presentation, as long as we continue moving and growing all of our scholars, we should or need the same similar le levels as last year. However, if we're just shy of those targets, we just need to make sure that we increase the amount of students that we are growing. So our growth. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Blackshear. Board members, are there any are there any questions? I, Very informative report. Thank you. I would agree. That, that was it, the that was an excellent presentation of the data. Um, I do have a few questions. Um, Thank you for the addressing the growth. So, so uh, to put a finer point on the growth question. So, I think. Th Last year, when the ratings, last year when the ratings came out, MDE basically put an asterisk by the ratings across the state and, and said, mm -hmm. you know, yes, these are the correct grades. However, growth was higher mm -hmm. because students were coming out of the pandemic. And so the question I, I have is, um, so there's a lot of upward, the trend in just about every slide is in the right direction. If we hit those proficiency levels, do I mean, do we need to have coming out of pandemic growth to get to the B? And, and is that possible? You will. So it is possible because we are doing it. We're currently um, sitting right at a C. So we still, we are right there. Um, you will need growth because the model itself makes up uh, about 400 points of elementary and the high school as well. So you will need growth for sure. I guess what I'm asking is. Um, in, in order to get the B? No, not do we need it in order to get the B. Was last year's growth an anomaly for JPS? The, the, the level of growth? Because we know we were virtual for 15 months and then we came back into the classroom and so of course we would have major gains and mm -hmm. so so, are we going to have? Is it? Do we? Do, does it have to be those conditions to achieve the the B? So we will have to have a significant amount of growth. Uh, come on. Uh, so we will have to have a significant amount of growth in order to sustain that to obtain that B. Mm -hmm. So currently, if we're looking at our growth from last year. If I'm not mistaken, um, we were sitting at about 68% or so on that subject. Let's say mathematics. Right now, we're looking at about 60% or so. ELA is the only area in which we are not um, at the growth and we're, we're not at where we should be in terms of growth, if that makes sense. Okay, that actually does make sense. So we, we're already seeing growth levels in mathematics that we saw the previous year. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, that actually answers. Okay, so we're getting close. It's, it sounds just the exception is ELA. Our exception is our ELA. That's what we're working towards. Okay. And, and you, you mentioned this, Doc. We are, we're still pushing on proficiency, and obviously if our right. proficiency is higher, that means we've grown. Right. 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 Um, also, just to call out, we know that we had uh, last year in the map assessment, the state assessment, um, real struggles, and we talked a little bit about it in the, the data here, real struggles um, at the middle school level. Um, and so there's some intentional work at middle schools and grade by grade, subject by subject to support there. Um, while we want to obviously want to see the proficiency shoot up, we know that we're getting more growth there because of we, we simply weren't performing, mm -hmm. right? We didn't see the performance across the board. Um, I'll see if, Doc, you have any other finer points to, to add to that, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the, so the reality is we need both, yes, the growth and um, proficiency. And um, you asked if it was an anomaly. I guess the answer to that is yes, because we, there was such, a, you know, such an impact from the virtual learning um, on our performance on the assessment the year prior, right? So there was much more growth from that to where we were this past year. Um, I'll also remind everyone that we've, been, we've just been in this transformation um, vein. And so um, while there may be other districts that are struggling with maintaining what they achieved this past year, our big question is, will we continue to see the upward trajectory mm -hmm. that we've seen? Or will our, our work from this past year to this year simply um, cause us to maintain? at the C level. Mm -hmm. We still have our eyes set on further improvement. So I don't, I don't want to count any chickens before they hatch. You all know that phrase, right? Um, but but um, you know, we've got our eyes squarely set on that. Great. Thank That's you. That's helpful. Yeah. How much time do we have left before the map assessments? The test is among is is upon us. Um, you know, we're starting to assess. Not everyone, you know, immediately. That it, it's spaced out by grade levels and divisions, and so um, where there's still opportunity to support. And that was actually one of the notes I made for myself. Where there's still opportunities to support, we are, um, and being strategic strategic about those specific skills and specific groups and subjects where um, you know, scholars just need a little more support or teachers need more supports with their scholars. The thing I want to call out, though, is so while we're talking specifically about the, the state assessment and the accountability grade from that, um, we're very clear that we need to be teaching bell to bell and from the start of school to the end of school. And so to the extent that our efforts to push in and coach and provide after school supports and all the things support and help um, our performance on the state assessment, great. Um, but we are understanding that the long game is continue teaching through the end of the year such that when we turn around um, in the fall that we've got a stronger base to build up upon to continue to see growth. And so, um, you know, I, you would think that that would be a given, but the reality is there's such a push, there's such prominence placed on the state test that we want to just keep messaging to everyone we're still in school mm -hmm. through the end of the you know, last day of school. Thank you. Uh, I just had two other questions. Um, so it looked like on most of the um, areas uh, on which there was a zoom in, so secondary ELA, if you looked at the benchmark three last year to the actual map test, the map test score was higher. Mm -hmm. um, but if you looked at math, particularly three to five, we saw that there was a decrease from benchmark three to, to the actual test. And in some instances, as, as much as a nine percentage point drop. Mm -hmm. what do we, and that's, that's, a wide, that's more than just reliability uh, on the test between the test and the benchmark and so what are we doing to make sure we don't fall off that much from the third benchmark to the actual test so i'm going to yield that question to the uh, assistant superintendents Amazing. to address 
Yeah. And as they're coming, I can I can share. I know that we've had some challenges with, and, and um, Mrs. Blackshear spoke to this earlier, if scholars are struggling, teachers want to stick, they want to stay there for a bit and really teach to mastery, um, which throws off the pacing. And so if they're not, um, if they're not moving through the curriculum, moving through the standards, if not all standards have been taught and taught to mastery, by the time we get to the state test, we'll have time after that through the end of the year, but by the time we get to the state test, then the scholars, although the paced assessment, um, well, the third is not paced, it's cumulative, um, th there are some skills that may not have been fully worked through with scholars, that show up on the on the map test. Y'all can correct anything I said. <laughs> we we just want to echo on yeah. behalf of the elementary team. Good evening to you all. Specifically, uh, the question on elementary math benchmark three. What we have seen is an increase and in beyond what uh, the map test is currently predicting. In fourth grade, however, we're just short of the target and fourth grade is our growth year. So we're actually looking at more, um, in addition to what Dr. Green has already shared, more alignment in the instruction, um, the curriculum standards, as well as to the assessment. So the tighter we align, the better we'll ensure mastery of those standards. Clarify growth year. Say it again. Clarify growth year. Growth year, it's a growth year because our third grade scholars, they are the first uh, scholars to take the test and so we'll be able to see in fourth grade mm -hmm. how much they grew okay. um, from third grade to fourth grade. Yeah. Very helpful. Thank you, Doc. Very helpful. Thank you, Dr. Grigsby. Uh, and the last question is really, is, I'm going to direct to you, Dr. Green. Um, so a common theme um, in uh, when we have schools that are achieving knocking out of the part is um, uh, tenure teacher tenure um, and stability of the staff within the building. Um, and then I often hear the inverse in, in schools where we are, um, where the numbers are not as high, that there's, te te there's turnover, someone may have left in the middle of the year. It, it just shows how critical the teachers are and I guess how critical retention is. So what are we doing at a district level to re retain uh, teachers and to create stability within our buildings amongst the teams there? That's a, a great question. Um, uh, a few thoughts on that uh, in, in response. So one, um, there's a lot of research out there that talks about why people leave um, and specifically why teachers leave. Um, you know, certainly compensation is among the top whatever, five or so. Um, but um, as much or more folks have lifted up um, levels of support or feeling unsupported, um, and two, uh, climate and culture, and three, the leadership, even outside of, mm -hmm. outside of any supports or coaching or professional development, the leadership um, uh, itself. And so um, as our um, assistant superintendents, as the, um, the various instructional coaches that we have throughout the district, the um, school support team, the curriculum leads, our external partners, as all of these folks are aligned and marshaled to support schools um, by tiers. We've got the schools tiered in terms of the needs and um, some of the issues that we've seen and, and areas to be supported. As we marshal all those resources, um, we're, we're, we are working uh, more diligently and more explicitly to clarify to teachers the kinds of supports that are available, to make time for those supports. Obviously, when you've got vacancies and you've got issues with, uh, with um, uh, substitute teachers, not being able to get them, you know, it starts to eat into teachers' planning time. Um, and so we're identifying and providing more time for planning and for um, teacher development during the year. Uh, we've, I would say that we've really ratcheted up our efforts around summer professional development for teachers. 
Um, we work really hard with our principals to ensure that their instructional supervision um, is hands-on, that it's collaborative, that it's clear, um, actionable feedback is provided to teachers. Um, that's why we spend so much time in our principal meetings and with the coaches that we, the external coaches that we bring in to support our um, assistant superintendents. Understanding that um, the work of the principal is not just about the operations in the building or keeping it safe and, and orderly. It's all of that support of our teachers. And the reality is we, you know, parts of, it's not uncommon in urban districts, but certain parts of, of our city and certain schools, um, you know, tend to uh, uh, um, be harder to staff um, and to maintain the staff. And so um, supporting our school leaders around some of the cultural pieces, um, social emotional learning is not just about the children, it's also about our, our educators and supporting them with managing their stress and feeling respected and, and all of those things. Um, it's not a, a one size fits all, it's, it really has to be nuanced based on the uh, context of each school. Um, but more and more you see principals leaning into the how do I build team? How do I ensure that my team members feel um, respected and valued and supported? Um, ensuring that principals get in there and roll their sleeves up and co-plan with teachers um, and that they're responsive when young people have behavioral challenges or where uh, parents may not be responsive or, or whatever the issue might be those sorts of things. That's, um, you know, that's, that's where we see the best opportunities to uh, maintain teachers over time, um, for longer at least, even if they're gonna leave in seven years or whatever the current trend says, um, but more than two years mm -hmm. where we can get some more traction. Great, thank you. All right, board members, any other questions on this report? All right, thank you again, Dr. Blackshear, for that information. Really, really timely, and uh, looking forward to the map results. Yes. All right, um, next we will move on to a review of the agreement between Mississippi Smiles Dentistry and the Jackson Public School District. Um, Ms. Thomas, our Executive Director of Climate and Wellness, will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. Board members, Dr. Green. Um, community members. It is a pleasure that I present to you on behalf of the administration a memorandum of agreement between Jackson Public Schools District and Mississippi Smiles Dentistry. The purpose of this agreement is to establish a guided working relationship between Mississippi Smiles Dentistry and Jackson Public School Districts. Mississippi Smiles Dentistry will conduct a comprehensive examination of our scholars' teeth. The examination will include cleanings, x-rays, fluoride varnish, and sealant applications as needed. Mississippi Smiles will provide services in five of our high schools, six middle schools, and 15 elementary schools. I am pleased to announce that on this evening I have with us uh, Ms. Ivana Lucas, who is our Community Relations Specialist and will be the liaison with Jackson Public Schools, as well as Dr. Allman, who's a dentist who will provide services via the mobile unit for our scholars. Great, thank you, Ms. Thomas. Board members, are there any questions? All right, thank you. Uh, next, we will move on to uh, the review of the agreement between Tugu College and the Jackson Public School District for the continuation of the JPS Tugu Early College High School Program. Ms. Marshall Thomas, our assistant, high, our assistant superintendent of the high school division, will present this information. A great evening, everyone. Good evening. evening. Um, the administration recommends the approval of the revised memorandum of understanding between Tougaloo College and Jackson Public Schools in order to renew the MOU for the continuation of the early college high school program, which was approved as um, an innovative schools program. Um, the early college program targets underserved public school student populations who may be at risk of dropping out of school or not continuing in post-secondary um, schools. Underserved students are students that come from households in poverty, students that are first-generation college goers, or students of color. In the district, our early college high school, most participants are minorities. 
participate in the free lunch program, and over 56% of those students are first-time college goers. Um, the students enrolled in the X have the opportunity to select an associate's degree program of study, which is composed of approximately 37 core credit hours, and that meets the IHL transferability requirements. This memorandum of understanding allows the X to continue operating while clarifying the roles and responsibilities of all parties involved. Thank you, Mrs. Marshall Thomas. Board members, have any questions, comments? All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we will have the Mr. Burke. We'll invite Mr. Burke up to take the next three um, items. Uh, the first is a review of policy AEAAGADR, paid legal holidays. The next is the 16 section school trust lands update. And the final is the audit findings report. So, Mr. Burke, we'll take questions in between each of these. This is information only. Um, but we'll just invite you to stay up here for this. Yes, yes sir. President Hubeck, Superintendent Green, board members, uh, JPS family, I have the opportunity to uh, recommend for action from the Office of the General Counsel that the Jackson Public School District Board of Trustees review the following recommendations related to the amendment of the policy discussed below. Policy AEAA slash GADR for, uh, titled Paid Legal Holidays. Uh, this policy uh, is being requested, uh, recommendations being made for an amendment to the policy. The Office of the Chief uh, Operations Officer recommends and the Office of the General Counsel support the recommendation to amend this board policy to change the name of the policy to legal holidays to provide more context and definition for when an employee may be paid on a holiday and to update to be consistent with current law. Uh, these policy changes were discussed with the Policy Review Committee on April 11th, and the Office of Public Engagement published the recommended changes in the policy under review section of the Jackson Public School District website on April 14th to provide members of the community and public an opportunity to review the proposed changes and provide comments. Thank you, Mr. Burke. Board members, any questions or comments? I'll just say thank you to the Policy Committee for continuing to keep these moving, keeping them in front of us keeping, uh, strengthening them, and for the um, process that in, in encourages public input as well. Okay, 16 section land. Yes, sir. I'm gonna, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Wilton Chucks Jackson, Executive Director of Assets and Property, to come up and provide you a brief overview of our 16 section trust land. Great. I'll move my book out the way. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Seabag, Dr. Dr. Green, board members, JPS family. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Wilton Chuck Jackson, I'm the Executive Director of Assets and Property. Uh, geared towards the major landmarks in our area, i.e. Lake Heiko, the Pearl River, Sidewell section, and our 20 quarter. Next slide. The overview of management. The big thing to take away from this slide is we manage 50 lease in the four sections generating $832,065. Next slide, please. Lake Heiko, four leases, generating uh, $33,780 a year. Next slide. Pearl River, one lease, revenue $1,655. Sidewell, three leases, annual revenue is $5,945. Next, next, the I-20 quarter, the I-20 quarter is the most popular or the largest number of leases in our four section, generating 42 leases and $790,685 annual revenue. Next slide. This slide right here kind of further breaks down the largest, i.e., the I-20 quarter, generating $790,000, $790,000 roughly in revenues and the number of acres used is 291. Next slide. The biggest part of our leases are commercial leases, generating $592,000 and uh, land usage or acres, 329 uh, acres. Next slide. This is an interesting slide. It kind of goes back over the last decade, and it takes us from, we started off with 91 leases in 2012, generating about 
$1.3 million to our high mark in 2019 of $1.6 million. Then it takes a significant drop off to where we currently are now, 20, uh, 2023. We have 50 leases generating $740,000 as of now. If nothing changes, this is, what we see right here is what our anticipated revenue for the next five years. Next slide. Current efforts. This is, this is my baby. This is a new, uh, I'm, I'm the new kid on the block. <laughs> so uh, every day we're going out trying to find out where is our money. <laughs> past due, where is our past due money? We want it. The other part of this is two to three days a week, myself and my team are riding around the city of Jackson looking at our property, make sure it's being properly maintained in accordance with the lease, make sure it's properly signed and it is clean. Gotcha. Other part of that is we are trying to stay in con on top of what we're showing in our system of forest leases versus what the Secretary of State is showing on as far as leases. Next slide. Improvements, big thing. The biggest improvement for we we're uh, shooting for is how we can market the vacant properties throughout the four sections. The other big thing is improving the signage. One of the biggest things on there that's going to help us roll into the, generation, uh, the, the generating of, of revenue is the forestry management plan. The forestry management plan, uh, we have a few of them that will be updated within this year. Actually, by June 30th, it will be updated. But it's going to uh, update for the next five years. And what it really does is going to allow us to be able to trigger right into the revenue, develop a timber strategy, how we be able to generate revenues from the, from the timber. Another thing we're looking at, too, is trying to figure out how we can sell, uh, we, not sell, we can lease tower space on all the different, four, uh, all four sections, not just in the 20 quarter where they are currently now, but the other four, three sections as well. Also, how can we um, lease land, a residential land? And the big thing for me right now is making sure that we stay on top of these appraisals, continue to stay on top of the appraisals. Next slide. This concludes my brief on your questions. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Board members, any questions, comments? <laughs> yes, ma'am. I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. That was absolutely excellent. Uh, it shows that the district is moving geez. forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> well said, Attorney Johnson. <laughs> I totally agree with you on that. I only have one brief question about, a, in your slide, you did mention solar uh, yes, power. but. It was written, but you didn't say anything yeah. about it. It's, it's, it's something we're working on. We had a couple of vendors to come to see us about possibly using some of our land to do solar mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. solar for solar farm. Solar farm. And one of the catch part of it was they were looking at not only for the revenue part of it, but also is how we can use it for our scholars to teach uh, solar. Yeah. I think so. I, I think that's an excellent idea. And, mm -hmm. As we well, I won't mention anything else, but solar farms. Yes, I think we've got we've we've got options and opportunities there. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. All right. Uh, next, um, we'll invite Mr. Burke back up to run us through audit findings. Again, President Seaback Board, I will be deferring to people. Mm -hmm. uh, I have um, our, one of our auditors here, Tyrone James, from an audit, our single audit audit firm. His partner was unable to make it. He has a, a new baby at home and had some duties. Uh, board President Dr. Green, board members, um, management and JPS family, and um, public. Uh, good evening. Um, again, this is a this is a privilege and honor for us to be here again to serve as your auditors. And we've done it before, but we took a break and now we're back. And I want to announce first and foremost that. Out of the 148 school districts, only a small minority made it 
to the state auditor office on time and to the federal clearinghouse, and, and JPS was one of them. For being the second largest school district, that's very good. We're still working with districts that we're still trying to get over the finish line. Well, that speaks to management and um, getting us the information we need when we ask for it and getting us not just the information but accurate information <laughs> that we could <laughs> obtain sufficient and appropriate audit evidence to render an opinion. All right. um, so those are the four things we're going to touch on today. The independent auditor's opinion, uh, state law and regulation compliance, and its opinion. Um, so we, get, we ran about four opinions in this single audit. Um, the independent financial uh, statement opinion, and then we are given a state legal compliance, which is a compliance program that a state auditor's office require us to do specific testing to each and every school district. Um, and then we ran an opinion on that as well. Um, and then we also ran an opinion on your major federal programs, and basically the grants that you receive. We take the largest ones required by the uniform guidance that's not been tested over the last three years, the type A programs. Any program over $2 million, we test it. All right, any programs um, below $2 million, we risk assess it. So we don't just let it, let it slide, we risk assess it. And if it's a high risk based on our tests, uh, we test it. Okay, um, so we, let me get into it. Next page. Um, so this, this is the uh, most important, this is what the banks, the creditors, and your bond buyers for your bond debts look at. The very first thing they look at uh, um, on the Federal Clearinghouse and the State Auditor's website. And we did state, in our opinion, um, of the financial statements were presented fairly in all material respect, you know, as of June 30, and in accordance with U.S. GAAP, as generally accepted accounting principles. Um, so this is the second opinion we rendered, and we had some instances of um, um, noncompliance. And this is this is this is what the state auditor prescribed for us to test. And it's either you have it or you don't have it. It's pretty cut and dry. It's not material. And and and, I, and, and what I mean by that, I'm saying material is we have a specific number based on your financial statements that we calculate that we deem to be very important if it's over that threshold, and we, 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 we test those numbers. Not so much for this. We just test exactly what they ask us to test. And whether it's material or not, we put it in a report. And I'll tell you, most of it um, isn't material. But we still have to put it in there um, so you can know what to improve upon in, in the future. <laughs> and the first one. It says finding number one. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So, uh, so first and foremost, we look at your rehirees, right? Uh, and we do a random sample. We take all the names of everyone that is rehired back to work for the district as a consultant or what have you. That is, um, and we sample it. During our test work, we noted that there were uh, employees that were rehired that received. Uh, payment uh, in excess of the statutory allowed uh, amounts. And what that means is if I was making $40,000 as a teacher before I leave, before I retire, I could only make $20,000 when I come back. And, and, and we saw where instances where people got paid in excess of the statutory amount. And, and it's simple. What we recommend to you is some sort of um, payroll system control that once this is set when you're hired. It triggers that, hey, hey, TJ or this employee, this rehiree is about to hit that threshold, and management could cut it off. Next slide. All right, this is the economic interest. This one's easy. This one's a very common one. This is where each and every board member has to go to the, um, the state ethics um, board website. And by May the 1st, you know, 
each board member has to fill this out saying, hey, we have no economic interest with any um, of these contracts or anything that we do with JPS, right? What we recommend to all our school districts and clients that we uh, serve is just make it a annual April work session. And everybody just bring their laptop and just get through it all at one time, right? And this is what we recommend and we see as a best practice. It, you know, when, when it's implemented, it happens. But I believe it was only one instance, so that's still pretty good. <laughs> All right. Uh, and and, and, and th these are the leases. Pardon me. You know, it's a, a every uh, when a when a lease payment is 60 days late, the necessary notices has to be um, sent out. But the next step that the state requires is a termination letter, and we noticed that some um, termination letters weren't sent out. And, and we, could, we, we could understand why this happens, right? Because if it's difficult um, to get the leases signed, you don't necessarily want to scare off your tenant, right, immediately with a termination lease um, uh, notice. But, you know, send them out anyway and then, you know, maybe pick up the phone and call, you know, Chuck, however you see, um, you know, best, the most amicable way of doing it. So they don't say, all right, you know, I'm out the lease, you know, because the district, it's a source of revenue, okay? You know, plain and simple. Next one, not that one. Oh, oh so, so let me mention this. And, and this is uh, something that you guys should feel proud of, right? There were no finding that we have, be it um, your internal control gas, governmental audit and standards finding, or your single audit finding um, that were material. And what we mean by material is, material is the amount was so, so significant and large it would prevent the, the management from detecting or uh, mitigating this, which, we could, which could lead to a material misstatement in, in your financial statement, i.e., make it misleading to the readers, right? We didn't have that. All we had was significant deficiencies, and that is just um, it's worth mentioning because they could graduate the material finding. Um, so, so it's worth mentioning so we could be proactive. In, in resolving these in the next year. So the first one um, that we found were travel. And um, this is something also that the state auditor pays close attention to, and they uh, is suggested us to pay close attention to as well. We test it every year, but this year now we test uh, more. So we would sample in the past 25, this year we tested 40, and we found um, employees didn't have all the Documentation. Documentation was provided to us, else the finding would look a little different. It'd be a, we, a, we may we call it material. But we didn't get the appropriate documentation we needed to, um, to, to definitively say that person attended the ceremony, i.e., for best practice, people should bring back the, um, the, the seminar agenda and maybe a sign-in and sign-out sheet when they're at these out of town or local conferences. Okay, not just the not just the 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 travel expense reimbursement form. We want to know that you and we said we mm -hmm. yeah, and it was only one as well, two out of forty. <laughs> yes. Name it. <laughs> and, and and it wasn't material, it was seventy three dollars, right? But it's again one of those things um, yeah that the, the, the state requires us to point out as well. Um, Next. All right, that one. So this is from your federal program, you know, under your uniform guidance. This is where we tested out of uh, $67.9 million, found on page 67 of the report. We tested five programs, um, Child Nutrition, Title I, SPED, and all the ESSA programs, you know, well in excess of 60%, so over $36 million, it goes to $40 million. So we tested hundreds of disbursements. Um, and we didn't have any problem with your allowable disbursements, okay? What we had a problem with was in child nutrition. The deadline set by the, the state, uh, Mississippi Department of Ed Education, Child Nutrition Department, is that your claim for reimbursement has to be submitted um, on the 12th, on the 10th of the subsequent month, for instance. So your May claim has to be submitted for reimbursement by June the 10th. 
And um, so we did the entire um, uh, school year, all 12 months. And um, we only had two instances that you were after the 10th. And that's pretty good too, but we need to have all the instances on time. Because it, again, it's compliance. So it's either you do it, either you did it right, or you didn't do it at all. There's no uh, gray area, there's no uh, professional judgment, right? Um, when you talk about federal compliance and state compliance, it's either you have it all correct or not. And, and, and that, that was it, which um, again, I must say, guys, we submitted this report. Your, our audit uh, of JPS in every school district is a, is a three-party contract, right? So we're contracted with you guys, and then you have to sign it, we have to sign it, and then it's with the state audit office. So in, in, in essence, they're outsourcing it to us. So then we send it to them, they review it, ask us a bunch of questions, as well as Mr. Burke and his team. <coughs> we answer those questions, and then they approve it, and it gets published on their website. And then we upload it in the Federal Audit Clearinghouse, which is what's due on March 31st. And the federal government sets the, the guidelines for the state. Um, so when you had years where you had extension, that's because the federal government extended it for another six or nine months. And uh, we submitted it in February, and you had a little back and forth, and it was approved on March the 6th. So that is very commendable because, um, and, and we're in constant communication with the state auditor's office. Only a handful um, were submitted on time because of some new regulations that were in place this year. So again, you should be proud, very proud of that and you're in compliance, both state and federally. So that's good. Any, any questions? Thank you. Board members, any questions or comments? I don't have any questions. I'm going to have to take some time to read this, but I'm just so very excited to see this data and present it in a way that I can understand it. And your presentation was very clear and helpful. So thank you so much. Are you? Tyrone. Mr. James or Mr. Duncan? Tyrone James. Tyrone, Tyrone James. James. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I also appreciate um, the level of detail shared. I got, I got a letter from the auditor's office last mm -hmm. meeting signaling the deficiencies and noncompliance findings, and so I asked Dr. Green that we jump on this and share it at the board level. So I appreciate you, Mr. Burke, for getting us information in front of the board timely. Um, board members, there is one finding associated with our um, engagement. I know Ms. Williams reaches out to us regularly. I'll just ask Ms. Williams, not for any names, but how are we looking for this year? Do, are we at 100% yet? We're at 100. All right. Good. Well, great. Good. So that finding won't be there next year. All right. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, thank you. And again, um, I think maybe what we need to do, we don't necessarily need to do it at a board meeting, but maybe we can just agenda it to be asked at the board meeting in, in April. So Ms. Williams, I'm looking at you because you do so much to keep us straight. So. All right, well, um, again, Mr. James, thank you. Um, if there are no other questions, we will move on with our agenda. All right, thank you very much. I, I have one question. Oh, I just thought about it. Uh, um, we had a meeting a couple of meetings ago where we were talking about the new... ERP, the, the uh, data system? Yes. Huh. To catch... Will it catch yes. that? Okay, that's what I wanted to say. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for remembering that. Okay. Yes, we're excited about the, the coming um, enterprise resource system to help us to better manage our data. Um, and yes, uh, we're certainly looking at, as one feature, something like that in HR or payroll, whichever, it, wherever it resides, that would flag this is a retiree, they're approaching their allowable hours, stop, or whatever. Mm -hmm. You're good. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Dr. Harrison, I'm sorry. Did you have a question or comment? I do, but it's not appropriate in this setting. <laughs> it's not important. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right, well, we're going to move on um, to items H, L, and J. And uh, I believe, Dr. Green, you've got the next series of um, agenda items. Uh, board members, um, th there are several um, moves that are needed to ensure that we can make investments into our buildings. 
um, within the timetable uh, that those investments need to be made um, um, because they're associated with uh, spending of federal dollars um, and other items. So Dr. Green, with this, I'll turn it over to you um, to share this part of our agenda. Thank you, Dr. Sivak. I thought I'd get up and get, take the hot seat, hot stance or whatever. As my team members have, board members, uh, to all of our team members and community members who are here, um, wanted to take some time, as Dr. Sivak has signaled, um, to speak to three items um, on your, your agenda for tonight. One is to talk through some um, relocations um, that are necessary in order to do some really important um, and major renovations in our buildings. Two is a um, reconfiguration uh, recommendation, and three is a um, consolidation recommendation. And so, as again, as Dr. Sivak has already named, um, the context for this conversation and this presentation is around our ESERT funds. We've got um, funds as a result of uh, the COVID uh, pandemic and um, an opportunity to uh, make some real investments and to address some real issues in our buildings and our facilities. Um, and uh, those dollars, uh, as much as we're excited to have those dollars, they sunset, um, the last of those funds sunset uh, next year. And so it's really time sensitive and these are major projects. Um, and so we've been thinking and planning and working with the professionals around how best to get as many of these projects done as allowable, um, you know, especially around HVAC systems, restroom renovations, um, uh, uh, any air quality issues and outdoor learning spaces. To get as much of, of that work done utilizing these funds um, because that's our best opportunity to do them. And so that has increased our urgency around some of the, the um, practical uh, operational aspects of, of this work. And so I wanna talk through a bit of that. All right. Um, and so again, um, to the urgency, there's uh, facilities ch challenges that we want to try to mitigate and address as well. Um, in addition to facilities challenges, there's um, an enrollment strengthening uh, uh, effort that we'll speak to. So first to the temporary school re relocations. Again, as named, um, we've got some schools that are, um, that are in need of some major work. And one of those schools is Pecan Park Elementary School. Uh, anyone who's been in the school, you, um, you know that the out outside the envelope of the building could use some love, but also the HVAC system um, and um, the foundational structural um, uh, issues in the, in the school that need some love. And so what are we, what are we recommending there or what are we uh, planning to do there is one to do the structural repairs and renovations at Pecan Park. I'm really excited to do that and have our scholars in a space that um, that they deserve and that is better suiting um, for them. Um, but that means that we would need that space without scholars and so we would um, plan to move our scholars and team from Pecan Park uh, to nearby uh, elementary schools. And so the plan would be to move our kindergarten through second grade scholars from Pecan Park to Lake Elementary and to shift our um, third through fifth grade scholars from P Pecan Park to Johnson Elementary. And why are we recommending this? Um, and you'll see this as a through line for all of these recommendations. It's to renovate the, the school facility and to do it in the time that we have available um, to ensure and sustain the, the school community. Uh, we want to invest in and, and make Pecan Park more attractive to our scholars and families and our team members, of course. And then as we've named already, we've got um, these ESER funds and it's time sensitive. We've got to expend these dollars um, in the next year in order to be reimbursed and, and to get this work done. 
so what to expect, the two things just return uh, regarding transportation and leadership. First, with transportation, we'll continue to provide transportation to scholars. We'll rethink and, and uh, reroute the scholars based on um, their homes and, and neighborhoods to the schools that would be receiving them over the, the course of this next year. And, and if I didn't clarify, this is for this next school year, for 23-24 school year. Uh, in order to do the work there. The two receiving schools, Lake and Johnson Elementary, we've got strong leadership in both, um, amazing leaders in both, and so, and space in both schools to receive those scholars and to support them and in, ensure their continued learning. Um, for staff members, um, obviously, if we're moving all of the scholars to those other two schools as receiving schools, then we would need the staff to serve them as well. And so um, our human resources team would work with um, our, our, um, uh, to provide the change of status uh, placement uh, letters for the team members that would be impacted by these changes. Um, our certified educators would be given first priority to the roles in the, the new spaces where they'd land. As you know, board members, as you've seen over the years, we have a bit of turnover and we, we lose staff each year and so uh, there are likely to be some slots that folks would fall into um, uh, opportunities for them to team or, or scholars there. There's, some cer there's certainly some needs there. There's some structural um, uh, challenges that absolutely have to be adjusted and, and, and addressed and this is not something that we could do working around scholars in afternoons or on weekends or during breaks or even over the summer. These are major, major renovations and, and repairs that will require us to give over to the um, um, construction companies the, the school to work uh, continually. Um, throughout the school year. And so this would be for the 23-24 for the, uh, school year. We would relocate the uh, Powell Middle School scholars to nearby Brinkley Middle School for that school year um, and re uh, retain the Brinkley scholars um, with the, the Powell scholars at Brinkley. We'll talk some more about that in a minute, um, um, plans for Brinkley. Um, why are we recommending this? Again, we want to complete these renovations um, at the facility. Um, we've also talked a bit about just beautification at Powell, so without ma making too many big promises, I'm just excited about what we're looking to do in that building, provide the stability there, um, and utilizing the funds that we have available to do the work. Um, Transportation will continue to be provided for our scholars, um, even at the, the receiving um, uh, school building, the Brinkley School Building. Um, and we're currently uh, interviewing for um, the new principal uh, at Powell. Our uh, principal has resigned, so we're, we're looking for a new uh, leader there. Um, for the staff members, there again, um, as I mentioned before, our human resources team will work through the placement letters and, and finding appropriate placements um, uh, for those who are impacted. Our certified educators would have first rights to um, and first priority to the roles in, in the receiving school. Um, and our operations team will be uh, supported in, in landing in that role at the new space or comparable roles elsewhere. In this case, we would, we would need the entire team from Powell since we're moving the entire school to the Brinkley Building. The next of the relocations, and again, I've shifted these slides around a bit. The next of the relocations um, has to do with Jim Hill High School and Isabel Elementary School. You all will recall that at the start of this school year, we had some pretty major um, concerns and challenges and complaints and um, just really struggled to maintain the heating and cooling in the building and uh, managing leaks and just all of the things that just continue to beset us at Jim Hill. And so the recommendation there is a complete HVAC and ceiling repairs and additional renovations 
um, throughout the building at Jim Hill High School in the main building. The, um, the ninth grade academy is in much better shape and so um, the, the work would be concentrated in the main building. In order to do this, here again, we cannot do this work with the scholars and the team members in the building. It's impossible to do the, the breadth and the, the, um, the scope of work that we have there in that large building around scholars after school weekends on breaks in summer and that. And so we would have to remove the scholars from the, um, and the team from the, um, from the main building. And so we'd shift, the plan is to shift the Jim Hill scholars uh, to nearby Isabel Elementary School. You may know that we are already operating our JROTC programming there, and so um, the plan would be to, for that school year um, of 23-24, move uh, Jim Hill operations uh, to the Isabel campus and also utilizing the ninth grade academy building um, on the Jim Hill campus. Um, just to ensure that we've got the space, though, uh, between those two spaces, we are doing a carve out. We plan to carve out for the rising ninth graders coming from um, North, uh, West, Northwest IB, Northwest Jackson IB Middle School, maintaining those scholars at Northwest um, Middle School. Uh, just again to ensure that we've got the space for all of our scholars between those three um, and maintaining some program integrity as well uh, with the middle years program of IB. Um, why are we making these recommendations? Here again, we've got some really major um, necessary and urgent um, renovations that must take place. We can't continue to patch the uh, systems at Jim Hill and we can't continue to, to um, respond to the concerns that we're hearing from scholars and team members and parents is just an untenable. Um, we want to maintain the, the school. We believe in Jim Hill. We want to support Jim Hill and want them to be in that space, but obviously we've got to give them a building that, um, that works for them, that's functional. And again, we've got funds that are going to sunset next year if we don't make some major moves right now. Um, and so we would utilize, again, the, um, it's the main building uh, at Jim Hill that would be offline. The ninth grade academy would be in use, as well as Isabel Elementary um, in use for Jim Hill Scholars, and the Northwest IB, IB Middle School for the rising ninth graders next year uh, to remain there. Um, obviously, if we are moving the high school into the elementary school, that means that the elementary scholars, unfortunately, would be uh, displaced. We're doing this because it's much, much easier to displace the elementary scholars than to try and displace a high school into other high schools. One, just developmentally, you've got the um, uh, relational challenges that um, are likely to be if you try to integrate a high school into other high schools. With our youngsters, although they'll be in different spaces, um, we can manage and support them um, better. And you're less likely to have uh, challenges between neighborhoods or d schools in that w amongst the younger scholars. Got strong um, leadership um, on deck for um, the receiving schools of Leicester and Marshall um, to, to welcome those scholars and the principal from um, Isabel will support grades three through five at Marshall. Um, so there'd be additional support to uh, support the older scholars at Marshall, the receiving schools. So um, you know, again, it's the, um, um, as the High school scholars go into Isabel Elementary. The Isabel scholars would be transitioned for the year, pre-K through two at Leicester, third through fifth at Marshall. And for um, the same approaches as we've talked about before with the uh, staff um, of, of uh, being affected by, by these school moves, the human resource team working on change of placement, um, for most of the um, high school team, they would simply be um, positioned, um, located differently, but in the same roles in that. Um, but uh, for operations staff as necessary, 
Um, and of course, as the Isabel team and, and school is split between the two receiving schools, we'd look at the staffing that needs to follow them to those two schools just to make sure that those schools have adequate staffing to support. All right, um, next I want to talk about um, the reconfiguration, um, one, of the, one of the actual um, recommendations that we're making to you board members. Um, it's reconfiguring Lanier High School. So one of the first things I heard, actually long before I even arrived here in Jackson Public Schools, um, one of the first stories and, and um, um, uh, I guess um, something that was, was touted and, and lifted up was the need to retain and support and, um, and, and protect Lanier High School. Um, and the Lanier legacy in that. And so, um, you know, that's been very clear to me, that's been very clear to our team, and so we've been working with that in mind. Um, and so our plan for the Lanier High School feeder pattern. Um, so we, we have been working um, within the, the Lanier High School feeder pattern to develop a, um, a way of better supporting the scholars, better connecting the scholars from elementary on up to middle and into high school, uh, supporting community members um, in that. And so we've been thinking a lot about kind of the enrollment patterns and um, where we're seeing uh, less enrollment. And it's true, we, we have been down, well, um, we're, we've, there's a slight uptick this year um, uh, at Lanier and we're excited to see that. But it's certainly one of our, it is our smallest elementary, or middle, hmm, our smallest high school is what I meant to say, smallest high school. Um, and so we want to think critically about and creatively about how we support Lanier to sustain over time. Um, you know, yeah, you all have probably seen these numbers um, over time, but just to keep it in front of you, um, although we've had a slight uptick of about nearly 40 students um, for this school year, we're still at about 600 scholars um, and down from where we were some years ago at in the 800s. Um, and the capacity of the Lanier building is at 1,400, over 1,400. And so, you know, just to, again, to keep that in front of you. Um, what's being recommended here is that we reconfigure Lanier High School as a 712 high school um, starting this fall um, and um, further in that recommendation is that the Brinkley Middle School scholars recall that I, I noted that the sixth graders would continue with the um, Powell Middle School um, at the Brinkley building while Powell building, the Powell building is being renovated um, but that seventh and eighth would um, begin attending um, the new Lanier Middle and High School. And um, very importantly, that we implement the community schools model at Lanier High School. This is something that team members, uh, community members, members of RJPS uh, and others, parents, and I believe um, uh, uh, the associate Lanier um, Alumni Association has been involved as well. But this is something that has been um, in the planning for well over a year, I believe we're approaching two years, um, planning and learning about the community schools model, understanding how it can be a benefit to Lanier, how we can better support the scholars and families and um, connect the schools and um, just create more of a community feel there and in order to ensure that scholars meet with success. And so why are we recommending this? One, we want to shore up enrollment at the Lanier, at the, at Lanier High School but, but, and connect the, the feeder pattern, at least middle and high school there, with the addition of the uh, seventh and eighth grade at, on the campus. And we have the space in order to kind of separate and, and, and um, put some distance between the seventh and eighth graders, the middle school over here, with the um, high school scholars, or separate from the high school scholars. We'd establish um, uh, our, our hope and our plan is to um, create more stability in the community um, and to um, maintain some fiscal sustainability um, by maximizing the 
um, enrollment in the building, investments in teaching and learning, and investments in the building. Um, and so without you know, trying to spread those dollars across more buildings to, to try and um, locate those dollars there uh, at Lanier. So what folks should, um, would expect to, to find with um, the middle and high school scholars would, as I've said, operate in separate wings of the building um, and have distinct entrances and exits. Um, the schedule is still being developed, but we want to separate those schedules just to, to further provide the distance between the um, high school and the middle school scholars. Transportation would be provided to the scholars um, and new routes would be developed to support this. Um, and the um, assistant principals at Brinkley, the two assistant principals at Brinkley would be transferred transfer to Lanier to support the middle school um, faculty and scholars. And so you'd have one principal at Lanier supporting between seven and uh, 12 grades with the, um, the assistant principal supporting uh, across the, the building, across the campus. And that one principal being Dr. Valerie Bradley, who's been a, been a champion of Lanier in the Lanier, commu Lanier community, but as well of uh, community schools, which we're, if you, hopefully you're hearing it in my voice, we're very excited about the funds that we've gotten to develop that community schools model and to bring partners together to make it something real and um, additive to the experiences there at Lanier. The Brinkley building. So um, we have been giving some thought to um, you know, w w what happens there at the Brinkley building. First, I want to um, you know, reiterate that our plan is to utilize the Brinkley building for this coming year for the Powell Scholars um, in order to do the work at Powell. We've had some discussion about the um, REAP uh, program going into the Brinkley building um, and, and you know there's an opportunity to do that but obviously we, we have to make sure that the building um, can sustain that the building um, at Brinkley can sustain and, and that we can um, that we wouldn't have to invest a, um, a ton of dollars in that building in order to bring it up to code since these ESER funds are going uh, away after next year, or they sunset next year, we have to use them by next year. Um, we would have to find a way to make any earth further investments, and we're just concerned that we may not be able to do that at the Brinkley Building. So further conversations about what happens after this coming school year where the Powell Scholars and team are um, utilizing the Brinkley Building. All right. Again, we would um, take um, uh, great pains to ensure that our resources, our human resources are, um, that everyone finds a home and that um, we're able to um, utilize and maximize the staffing that will continue with us, even as we look at any vacancies that we might have and trying to backfill those or to recruit for additional um, support. And the last, uh, thing that I wanted to share with you this evening. So we've talked about the schools that um, have major renovations and require us to relocate those scholars into swing space for the next year while we do that major work. We've talked about the reconfiguration of McLean into uh, McLean high, uh, Middle and High School, consolidating um, the Brinkley School into McLean. And the, what did I say? McLean, I'm sorry. McLean is Tulsa. I had a. I forgot where I was. McLean. Oh my God. Um, what is it? Lanier. 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 McLean. I said that several times too, didn't I? I forgot where I was. Lanier. Lanier High School. Lanier High School. Um, and then um, finally, I want to talk to you, uh, board members, about the consolidation of Baker and Shirley Elementary Schools. So um, what, we recommend, what we are recommending here is to shift the Baker Elementary School to the nearby 
Shirley uh, School and consolidate there. Baker Elementary School, um, I believe we've shared some time previously, but uh, Baker Elementary School, um, the HVAC system has been um, seriously vandalized and stripped of their components. Um, these are their costly repairs and they couldn't, um, just by our investigation, we couldn't uh, complete those um, to start the year comfortably. comfortably. Um, as well, in order to, and, and that would only be to get the system up to where other systems are um, that are, are problematic. And so the actual um, uh, repair and replacement of the HVAC system is estimated at about 2.5 million. So qu quite costly um, at Baker. And um, we, we want to think more strategically as we're looking at the footprint, footprint of our schools, as we're looking at our enrollment right now, this opportunity to invest in buildings and provide our scholars and team members and families with buildings that cool consistently, heat consistently, um, you know, aren't taking in any water. Um, these are just some of the things that we've been um, noodling and contemplating. Obviously, we want to enhance teacher collaboration. And so when you have a smaller school that's hard to do, um, greater equity in the course and elective offerings. And so again, with a smaller school, it's hard to be able to afford um, the additional staffing for an art teacher, art teacher and a music teacher and a, you know, additional counselor if that's what we see is needed at the school. Also increased, increased access to the certified educators where we are not constantly looking for um, trying to fill positions across m more schools by um, either brand new teachers, novice teachers, or emergency certified teachers. Um, and then lastly, again, the fiscal savings um, on, on staffing if, as we bring those, those scholars together. Just to share with you some numbers, the Baker uh, Scholar or Baker School currently has 198 scholars attending. At Shirley, currently there's 164 scholars. Shirley, the building happens to be in better position, and so hence the, the move to consolidate into the Shirley uh, Elementary School building. As you see together, we still only have 362 scholars, but that would uh, provide us with so many economies to staff and provide resources and supports to our scholars and families. Transportation, as with all of the other moves and recommendations, would be provided and we re reroute um, based on where the scholars live and um, into uh, the receiving school at, at, at uh, Shirley. Um, we've got special education programs that uh, we continue to provide the supports to our scholars and um, based on their individualized education plans, their IEPs. We also have um, uh, English language learners uh, who are uh, being supported at the school and so they would continue to receive the so supports through their general education program even at the consolidated school and so just um, to name that we know that we've got scholars with different needs uh, who would be coming together and we're already planning and thinking through how to ensure that those supports that they are entitled to that they have those. The leadership at Shirley Elementary School is a veteran leader, uh, Dr. Veals. Um, she's done some really great work in ensuring that um, uh, uh, Shirley Elementary School is continuing to grow and, and, um, and develop. Um, she's uh, really leaned in as a veteran leader. She's leaned in to um, our learning and um, the, some of the newer programs that we're lifting up um, and efforts that we're lifting up across the district, especially around real-time feedback to teachers and um, supporting in really important ways. So we would be excited to have the scholars learning under her tutelage and her leadership at Shirley Elementary School. I've done a lot of talking. I want to just put back in front of you the summary of proposed moves. So it's Lanier High School and um, Lanier High School, Lanier High School, and Brinkley <laughs> Middle School um, reconfigured as a 712 in the Lanier campus. Powell Middle School um, being relocated temporarily at the Brinkley Building um, while we do major renovations at the Powell Building. 
Pecan Park Elementary being relocated temporarily for this next year, um, K-2 K to Lake Elementary, and three through five to Johnson Elementary. Uh, Baker um, being consolidated and shifted uh, to the uh, elementary, uh, Shirley Elementary School. Jim Hill High School utilizing Jim Hill's uh, ninth grade academy, the Isabel Elementary School building, and um, the, the rising ninth graders from Northwest remaining at Northwest to serve them over the coming school year while we do major work at Jim Hill. Um, and then lastly, for our Isabel, Isabel uh, Elementary babies who would be displaced as we're serving Jim Hill in their building, um, serving those uh, scholars temporarily over the next year, pre-K-2 at Leicester, three through five at, at Marshall Elementary. And we're also looking at ways to um, show some love to the Isabel um, school building so that as those scholars return to their building after this coming school year, that they come back to something that's noticeably different and better about their school space. For lastly, board members, just want to call out that um, you know we've had some experiences um, previously with consolidations and and you know moving um, scholars in order to do some major renovations. And so our property accounting team would uh, be working to support um, teachers and schools with boxes and packing and and moving items as necessary. And that would start um, towards the end of this. Uh, school year and into the summer. Transportation team is already running the traps and, and looking at the routing and um, uh, looking at ways to um, ensure greater efficiencies, but, but also to get our scholars to school on time um, and, and home safely. Um, and then a big piece, and I know some board members have lifted this up, and this was something that um, we've seen previously uh, a need and, and something that would truly benefit as we're bringing scholars together into, um, um, into a building. Uh, planning some activities over the summer that would help to integrate the, the uh, scholars. And so um, thankfully, the, um, although the, we would be uh, reconfiguring at Lanier, the Brinkley scholars and uh, Lanier scholars, with some, you know, some space between them, distance between them, um, and separate wings. Still, we want to help the scholars to feel at home, feel a part of the new school where they'd be learning um, going forward. And so, specific work there, um, and and then for the elementary sc uh, scholars, helping them to get to know teachers as our st other staff members who are already on board get to know the building, get to know the space, bus routes, all those things, and, and one another, just to build, start to build community so that their first uh, experience in their new community is not on day one of school, um, but being thoughtful about that. All right, board members, um, I've said a lot. I want to uh, see what questions you have. What can I clarify or um, any questions that you have, any concerns that you want to raise with regard to all of this. I know there was a lot, but um, we can take it in chunks. The relocations first, perhaps. Those schools, Pecan Park, Powell, um, Jim Hill, and yeah, and Brinkley, um, yeah, and Brinkley, or Isabel. Well, Dr. Green, um, this has been very, very thorough and very well put together and a lot to understand and digest. Mm -hmm. But I can see that it has been well thought out. Um, I am eager to find the best way to share this uh, new phase of making JPS better and stronger than we even thought about, at least right now as I think about this, to get us ready for this. It almost reminds me of the uh, bond referendum and, and the and, uh, early things we had to do to get out of the dilemma we were in with state takeover. And it's a lot to understand, but once, as I'm beginning to understand it, 
and your presentation is very helpful and there's a lot of good information here, that this can be nothing but really good for us once we get through getting the work done. Yes, that's that's going to be hard when you're telling me, my grandbaby, and I love the school I'm in, now I got to go to another right. school, you know, it really becomes difficult on the people on the ground, those mm -hmm. on the ground. But the beauty of it is we know that and we know our communities and we've got board p members who can help explain why we're moving in this direction now. Um, and the way we are, and, it, and it's really kind of a, a temporary, um, uncomfortable situation to have to be in with your family and figuring out how to get family operations wrapped around these new uh, challenges in some ways. But I think we can do it um, by really taking some, some time as you move forward with finding a way to reach to our communities by ward, uh, as, at least a piece of it, some for everybody, anybody who wants to come, just to kind of yes. hear out and talk. And so mothers and aunties and uncles and daddies and big brothers will have in their mind, well, now how am I going to get yes, this, you know, on, on my street? I know the young people who are taking their little brothers and sisters here, there, and yon. So it's a lot of that will have to be done. But once we see uh, the wonderfulness of, of great historic Lanier and what Jim Hill could be again, I mean, people are going to be happy. They're going to yeah. love that. So we've just got to find a way to help our communities. You know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we got we got one more a few more lists to make to get to where we really really want to be and know we can be and should be and will be. Yes, ma'am, Dr. Harrison, you're you're absolutely right. So, um, you know, we went back and forth as to you know whether we have those conversations in communities um, first or have the conversation here. On the heels of this presentation, team members are, are well, actually already in the midst of talking to uh, school communities, and we'll continue with that. Um, the, you know, we, we're pretty resolved at this point. Um, two, two big factors that I, I just want to stress, um, even as we go, you know, fan out into commu uh, school communities to talk about this is. Um, you know, we, we've heard loudly and clearly that there are some situations that are simply untenable. Mm -hmm. I, I was clear last fall, I'm not, I can't go back to Jim Hill mm -hmm. without fixing mm -hmm. that HVAC system. Mm -hmm. Now we ran traps and looked at ways to fix it without removing scholars. You just can't do it. You can't do it. it, it what happens is it, lo it elongates the process, the construction process, the renovation process, if they can only work after school and uh, weekends and on breaks. And it's more costly um, in order to, to do it that way. Um, you know, wish that we could do all of this work and, and you know there's many more projects that will be done mm -hmm. so let me also name that there are many more schools where we've got projects and you you see it in uh, some of the the items that are on the on for uh, board action this evening under consent and so um, but these are the ones where it was such major work that we we had to be honest about what it's going to take and and come to the realization and it was painful for us, yeah. but to come to the realization, we, we can't do this work with scholars in the no, building. Can't. You, and, and I think you've made all the right decisions here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's efficient. It's going to happen. Uh, people are ready to do it. Everybody seems invested in it. Your team is ready to go with this plan. We can make it happen. And it's, in a year, 18 months will be over just like that. And then we'll all be just so happy. Yeah, I mean, the big thing for us, uh, one other big thing after this initial um, round of conversation with community is keeping folks updated on some of the work that's happening, mm -hmm. um, just helping mm -hmm. folks to see. You know, we don't have renderings right now. It's easier when you can show people the shiny new building that they're going to have. We don't have those renderings right now, we've, and we've got to get moving on, on all of that stuff. 
Um, but the soonest that we have that, the you know, um, I think that, that too will help uh, team members, scholars, families, community members to, to see that, no, we're, we're not joking. This mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. really happening. And plan to go to our um, ward community meetings. Mm -hmm. you know, have somebody go to those just to be in the mix. So mm -hmm. Somebody might want to ask them a question. Because when mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Burke and Dr. Um, my friend for 100 years, and I'm losing it. Okay, I think it's Dr. Merritt. Mm -hmm. When they came to our uh, community meeting, it, was, it helped so much mm -hmm. for people to hear and ask all the questions they yeah. wanted to ask. Yeah. I totally agree I with you, that. and especially when um, we're using the, the funds that we've been accused of not using. I think the plan and everything that has had to be put into place in order for us to get the best and the most use out of these dollars, um, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that work and that time and that effort. And now this is a really hard part too, but the more that we can convey that message to community, the better we position we will all be in to work together and not have any infighting. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. And I, and I, you know, I want to lift up. I'm, I'm still anxious about the timeline because we're still recovering from, you know, the pandemic days with labor challenges and supply chain challenges and all that. We still believe we can do this work. Um, but there are a couple of them that are so robust that we'll likely run up to the line um, to complete those projects and, and get scholars back in the building. So, um, but, but I'm with you. Um, that's got to be part of the continued messaging. Mm -hmm. Other questions about relocations while we do work? Or comments or any of that? Oh. Everybody looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you pulled the mic down, so we were clear. <laughs> so, so, so I'm I'm amazed that uh, the administration has been working on this for, I think you said two years. The the community schools piece. Uh, no, I think you alluded to this uh, merger. Oh, that's the way I understood it anyway. No, I'm sorry if I, if I wasn't clear. That, that was, I was specifically talking about the um, community schools um, model. They've been planning that over nearly two years and maybe longer. Three, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't mean to disrespect your work. Three, three years, the community schools model um, and wanting to implement that at the Lanier um, High School, middle school. And, and I also need to say I'm thankful, like Dr. Harris, that, that you uh, saved the Lanier High School, uh, W.H. Lanier, I think a 1921 graduate of Tougaloo College. Uh, I'm really glad of that because of, and you do honor the legacy of, of Lanier. Uh, when we did something similar with uh, Bailey. Yes. And we moved those scholars to uh, Northwest. They retained the name of uh, Bailey. Is is it going to be any of that with Powell especially? When Powell moves to the Brinkley building, will they still be considered Powell or the yes. Yes, sir, they will be, because we're using the building as a swing, temporary swing space, and they're mm -hmm. going back to their building, okay. but a refreshed, renovated, improved building. Mm -hmm. So they will um, go back as Powell. Yes, sir. And when the scholars from Brinkley moved to the, uh, I, it skips me the words you used, uh, Reconfigured Linnea, mm -hmm. they they'll assume the name Linnea. 
That, that, is, that is the recommendation. That's the plan. Yes, sir. All right. Though um, we can always look at ways to um, retain some, some um, honoring of the Brinkley name. Um, I, don't, I don't know how. That's something I'd want to talk to the team about or, and others. But, um, but right now, the plan is that it's the Lanier Middle and High School. My understanding, and you may know this better than others, is that um, Lanier was once a middle and high school, or junior and high. It was. Um, and mm -hmm. perhaps some others as well. Yeah, and so was Jim Hill. And Jim Hill and Brinkley. And Brinkley. And Brinkley, gotcha. Yeah. So, so sorry. That's, I'll, I'll close with that. Yes, sir. Appreciate those questions. Anything else on the, um, if there's nothing else on the, on the um, temporary relocations while we do major renovations, um, want to, um, I don't know, yeah, want to go to the reconfiguration piece and ask specifically um, any additional questions or feedback on that? Of Lanier High School consolidating with Brinkley? I would actually, I would say if, there, if there's any questions or comments or on the whole plan rather than okay. just. Dr. Green. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Hillier. I don't have a question, but just a comment. Um, this, if I think about it, this, uh, Dunking challenges that we are faced with. And one of the things that keeps coming to my mind is um, has to do with the EFRA bonds. You know, if we, we that is, there is much that has to be, well, decisions that have to be made, first of all, I guess, and then uh, moving forward with whatever uh, decisions are agreed upon. Um, and you're saying that the extra funds have to be set by when? By the fall of, of uh, 2024, so effectively, um, um, just twenty twenty four, so about a year and a half. Indeed. And then of course, you know, my second thing is okay, um what happens <laughs> that's our source of money, I guess, is what I'm thinking in terms of uh what happens if this is not accomplished in that length of time. Uh, great question, Mrs. Hilliard. Um, and so, again, for anyone who may have missed it, the question was what yeah. happens What happens with those funds, those ESER dollars, if, mm -hmm. if they're not spent within that period of time? Um, uh, yeah. they, will, they will be lost to us. Remember that these, yeah. are, these are funds for reimbursement. We have to spend first and then submit to the Mississippi Department of Education for reimbursement. So we have to have encumbered, expended, and that means um, uh -huh. completed the projects and signed off on the projects and gotten the final bills uh -huh. and paid for that in order to submit for um, reimbursement in order to get that. And so uh -huh. that means we've got, to, we've got to move on those projects. Yeah, got to move whatever decisions. We don't have a whole lot of time to do. <laughs> negotiate, I don't suppose. Uh, Especially if we are depending on these funds to do, and I know that there are uh, everything that you pointed out, you know, is a need, need, need situation uh, here. Uh, so that's just my comment, you know. It's, 
Yes, That's what I was thinking. Uh, yes, ma'am. We got to move whatever way. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions or comments, board members? I'm just wondering what members, uh, what we've communicated with members of our team so far uh, in these schools. Do they know anything? And what's the timeline for communicating all of this with our community? Yes, team members um, in the last couple of days, um, we've been giving them a heads up that we're coming to the board so they don't hear it, you know, first here. Um, and then going out to a uh, broader community around um, um, these changes and um, some of the impacts that they'll have to scholars, to team members. There are lots of moving pieces that um, we now have, a, a, with a bit more planning, we've got, some, we've got some answers for questions that folks might have about bus routes and schedules and all that sort of thing. Like this with our yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And if you know of meetings that are happening um, and want to share them, we'll do our best to field those those meetings. Um, but we, we would like to to start with meetings from the schoolhouse and with scholars and families and and folks there. And and any community members should kind of join us there because our capacity to go out and and you know. Um, facilitate all those those meetings is you know stretched so yes ma'am dr luckett and other um, raised the question around the the communications plan um you know i would i would actually argue that the the this last slide what's planned for the spring we should have a box for communication um, and that may be the integrate of the school communities, but just can't, can't emphasize enough. Um, it's not just from the district level. It's got to be from the you know, parents. You know, there's, the principals have ways that they communicate to, to parents and, and guardians and equipping that kind of school level communication. And, and some of them just basing off of going through one of these is, is um, it's, it's got to be more than just central office kind of rolling out gotcha. the, the comms plan. And, and so really want to push like how we just make sure that, that there are multiple touch points with parents at the school level, guardians at the school level. Um, so it, it's clear, and Dr. Harrison, you were bringing this up, just the anxiety that, that, that arises when there's moves and shifting there's there's no doubt that, that we will come out stronger you made this point dr hairston it's one out of every four schools in our district that's going to experience some level of um change yeah I, I don't want to use that word but i guess it's probably appropriate um you know there's either students coming in students going out that's a lot that's a that's a lot of of and so rolling out the communication in a way where people aren't left behind um i would say uh, um enlist us if, if you're having a, a community if you're having a meeting in a school with parents and guardians please invite board members please make sure we know I, i'm not saying we can always be there but but i know this board does you know want to be there and part of it if we can um so those, those those are just 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 some thoughts. Um, I, this is starting tonight. There's two agenda items in the finance section mm -hmm. around the Com Park and Jim Hill. So while this is information only, effectively we're we're being asked to set the gears in motion. Um, and so um, there's no reduction in force, correct? No. Okay. Um, and uh, just another technical question where is reap currently at the f french french it's at french yeah. okay okay that's all i've got really but th i guess and and i'll say thank you it, it's 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 clear that a, a ton of time thought 
work went into this um, and we're just getting started. Um, so thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. I have one last question. Mm -hmm. Who, our parents already know this. Our, our principals have already talked with us. Some parents likely know, but um, we've not done the full-on um, parent engagement. Okay, well, is, am I being premature there? But now that no. we've got, it's on not the, at all. It's on no, the no, 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 yeah. not yeah. at all. No, no, it's time. It's, it's we need to let it's folks time. know. And it's time. Have a meeting where y'all can come and talk, and we can yeah. do this. I mean, it, it would have been great to, anyway. Yes, mm -hmm. it's time for parents. Uh, I was just going to note the, to the points around um, um, communications, parent meetings, community meetings, um, communications, not only from the district, but also from school leadership. Um, Ms. Uh, Williams is capturing some notes. And so um, we will endeavor to add to um, uh, future board meetings some of the communications efforts just so you know that that stuff is happening and or what has happened just previous to that meeting to keep you updated on the uh, efforts around communications great um, you, you, yeah that sounds great uh, and this will go up on the website right in terms of for this board meeting yes okay great absolutely I think we're good board members any more questions or comments this is good, thoughtful work. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the whole team. Yeah, thank you to the team. Lots, yeah, lots of work. <laughs> lots of work. I, I'm even thinking of, just as I'm thinking, like, I know people don't look at the whole board meeting, but if that section that you, your whole presentation mm. can be pulled out and put in, like, as a special kind of yeah. infomercial, about what's happening that would be good to to put on the YouTube. Excellent. Either this or maybe I great recommendation. Maybe I re re record it. But sure, yes. <laughs> One way or another, yes. Yeah. To pull that out. Good great idea. Thank you. Hadn't thought of that. Thank you, board members. Great. Thank you, Dr. Green. All right, board members, um, we will continue on. Um, we will move on to the information action item section of the uh, board agenda. Uh, Mr. Burke, I'll invite you up. We have the request to approve the monthly financial report for the month ended March 31st, 2023. Thank you, President. See back board, remaining JPS family and friends. The administration recommends that the board approve the monthly financial report for the month ending March 31st, 2023. Uh, the monthly financial report contains the statement of fund balance, budget status report, budget, uh, bank reconciliation report, and the district maintenance cash flow report. Uh, highlights of the report are as follows. From the statement of fund balance section of your report, uh, for the general fund section, those are the fund, the 1,000 funds, District maintenance fund balance, the, prim the preliminary ending fund balance as of March 31st was $28.1 million. This is approximately $4.5 million higher than it was this time last year. That continues to be due to start strong starting fund balance and uh, tight monitoring of expenses so far through this year. Uh, district maintenance revenues are higher than expenditures by approximately $5.7 million. Reference on page 7, 16 session revenue. I also want to thank Mr. Jackson for doing a fine presentation on the 16th section. He uh, talked about our revenues. Um, so far this year, year to date, we've collected $703,000. That is approximately 83% of the budget. We anticipate another 190 or so uh, to come in in collections. A special revenue section funds the 2,000 funds, referencing on page 7, uh, child nutrition fund 2110. Uh, uh, continues to have a strong fund balance. Uh, the title funds, the coronavirus funds, the IDA funds, and the other special revenue funds, uh, we are currently carrying a negative balance in those funds of about $6.8 million, but we did request $4.1 million as of March 31st. So there's about a $2 million gap, and that is really, we've really tightened that up uh, since July. So very happy about that. 
In the budget status report of section of your report, as of March 31st, uh, our fund balance budgeted was, uh, we, uh, fund balance budgeted used um, was uh, 40 million. We've actually used 9.2 million of that fund balance to uh, help with the, uh, this actual expenses. We collected revenues of 152 million, which is 80% uh, of what we budgeted. We've uh, expended 146.5 million, which is 77.8% of what we budgeted. Our budget did uh, revenues and expenditures were even um, at 188.4 million. Revenues collected across all funds. We've collected total 100 and uh, not all funds, other funds, all other funds. We've collected 103.3 million, which is 34.3 percent of what we budget to expend in revenues. And we've uh, expended 118.2 million, which is 34.6% of what we budgeted to expend. Our total budgeted revenues for this year was 489.6 million. Added to our 40 million that we brought over in fund balance, our total budgeted expenditures then was 529 million. Of that number, we have expended totally 49.96%, and we have received in new revenue 52.21 percent of what we budgeted. Bank reconciliation section, our bank reconciliations are current as of uh, February 28th for all of our uh, funds. All of our funds are deposited in board approved depositories. Cash flow report as of March 31st, 2023, we have an ending cash balance of 18.5 million as compared to our cash balance in 22 at the same time, which was 15.6 million. That is 18.2 percent more increase over our prior year position. Other KPIs, revenue collections are 3.14 million ahead of March of last year. Our year-to-date expenditures are still about 0.28 percent more than last year, but our overall percentage of expenditures year-to-date is 1.13 less than last year. So we're in a good financial position. That is the Finance report for this month. I'll entertain any questions, comments, and as always, I'll take any criticisms <laughs> that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Bird. Board members, any questions, comments? Or criticisms. Or, or criticisms. Or yes. criticisms. <laughs> That's how we grow. Mm -hmm. Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? I move to accept the uh, financial report as submitted. <laughs> Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have, thank you, Mr. Burke. Next, we have the request to approve the signing bonus addendum for school year 2023-2024. Dr. Knowles will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. <coughs> Excuse me. Dr. Green, Board President Sivak, mm -hmm. and members of the board. The, administrator, the administration has submitted for approval the recruitment incentive contract addendum for the 2023-2024 school year. This incentive, also known as our sign-on bonus, is used in the efforts to attract and retain certified new employees to Jackson Public School District and hard to stay. <coughs> I think that, that got it. Okay. So currently we, uh, we have 87 certified employees that are working within the school district uh, that are receiving the contract incentive of that 87. Uh, six of them are on the previous version of the incentive. We have 44 that are working in hard to staff areas. So this includes elementary education, uh, early childhood, English as a second language, and mathematics. Uh, we have 32 that are in our critical need areas, which includes special education, um, biology and English, and then we have five that are receiving the career and technical educator sign-on bonus. I also included a breakdown of the recipients by area. Um, of the categories included, you have uh, essentially 27, I think I counted, no, 29 categories from first grade all the way up through high school, and so in, um, I included by breakdown the ones that are critical need teachers, hard to staff, as well as CTE, and of course those that are on the previous agreement. And just as a note, this is the last year of uh, teachers that are receiving the previous version of the contract addendum. 
And so as they meet their, fulfill their uh, obligation to the district receiving the incentive, then of course that frees up opportunity for us to recruit and retain more educators. So. Great, thank you, Dr. Knowles. No, this is great information. I think 87 teachers over the last two years, that's, that's, that's evidence. Um, so thank you. And board members, um, just uh, our council has shared, uh, it's not a signing bonus, it's an incentive. Uh, so just in terms of uh, language and um, what we're approving, we're improving a, an incentive program. Uh, um, any other questions, comments? <laughs> Great. Thank you, Dr. Harrison. Uh, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. The motion carries. Next, we have the request to approve the agreement between communities and schools in the Jackson Public School District. Dr. William Mayer, our Chief of Staff, will share this information. Great evening to Dr. Sivak, board members, and Dr. Green and JPS family. The administration is recommending the approval of the MOU between Jackson Public School District and the Community and Schools, Inc. Um, in response, what's the difference? So communities, community schools is more so a strategy. Both programs deal with uh, providing uh, wraparound services and support. Community and schools really looks, they, um, they really, uh, you look at what you can provide the child uh, or the student after school, there's some, th some components for that versus communities in schools, it's really focused in on what supports can be provided to the uh, child both at school. So um, these grants complement each other in terms of implementation and we know that we will see some positive results from it. Great, thank you Dr. Merritt. Board members, are there any additional questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a, oh, oh, oh sorry, Mr. Figures. <laughs> uh, so, so Dr. Merritt, I really compliment you for explaining that mm -hmm. so thoroughly because it's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. in there and a lot of uh, need for understanding around the community about the two distinct initiatives. Yes, sir. So you, what you said is going to go a long way uh, to clearing that up. And, I'm, and I, for one, am thankful. Yes, sir. Will they be operating concurrently? Five yes, ma'am. I believe for five years, um, three to five years. I'm drawing a blank with that. But there will be, um, of course, there's a staff person already at Lanier. For the communities and schools, we will hire a district coordinator to oversee the implementation, as well as identifying a staff person in each school to help implement uh, the program. And again, this is all about bringing services um, to uh, our students. The community schools model really focuses on parents and students. So that's what kind of, that's an additional component that makes them unique in terms of they look at the family um, as a unit. And, and again, the funding from NEA was planning, there's a planning grant. Right. And so helping us to shore up one of our own understanding and, and development of the kind of how this could and should live in Jackson Public Schools and specifically in the linear feeder pattern. And then this um, uh, communities in schools, communities and schools. Um, grant more for the um, starting on some of the implementation. How do we support our scholars in connecting with the resources that exist throughout the community and, and elsewhere um, and connecting those individuals to the scholars and families and, and having the capacity to do more of that. You know, lots of people can tell you there's a resource downtown for X, Y, or Z, but if you don't know it and there's nobody to tell you <laughs> about it and how to access it and all the ways to do it, then, then 
it falls short. That's right. Yeah, we've had the community's in-school concept in JPS when my children were in elementary school, I believe, and then it kind of faded away, but it, JPS is recognized in some of the research when they talk about the origin of the communities and schools work. So I was glad that uh, my colleague asked the question about the distinction between communities and schools and community schools. And one of the tenets of communities in schools is attendance. So it's really focused on getting students, in, making sure that they come to school daily in order to receive uh, the support. So that's kind of their sweet spot mm -hmm. as well. Great. Uh, board members, is there a motion to approve? I move we approve the agreement between Communities and Schools, Inc. and the Jackson Public School District. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Dr. Luckett has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Uh, next, we have the request to approve the renewal agreement between the Pool Partners, Kids First Education, and the Kirkland Group in the Jackson Public School District. Dr. Regina Scott, our Executive Director of School Support, will present this information. Good evening. Good evening. Board President Dr. Sivak, board members, Superintendent Dr. Green, and JPS family. The administration recommends review and approval of the lead partner contract supervised support to secondary students focused on English language arts and mathematics to Kids First Education and the Kirkland Group. Kids First Education will provide uh, English, language, English language arts support and the Kirkland Group will provide support in mathematics. Thank you, Dr. Scott. Board members, are there any questions, comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I'm sorry. The motion carries. Next, uh, we have our consent agenda items for finance. All of the agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? Hearing none, is it the one, I just wanted to double check the agenda. I had one item on the, I wanted to just make sure the language was right. I want it. This was around the, yeah, the rejection of the bid. Oh, it's been resolved. Okay, the recommendation, which has been corrected on the summary. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, board members, um, got the information I needed. So, so is there a motion to approve the consent? Thank you, Ms. Williams. Is there a, a motion to approve consent agenda items finance? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison is moved. Dr. Luckett is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. Next, we have the consent agenda items general. Uh, all the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Dr. Harrison has moved. Dr. Luckett has seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The motion carries. Next, we have consent agenda items personnel. All the consent agenda items have been reviewed by the board previously, and we've had an opportunity to ask questions of the administration. Are there any further questions? If not, board members, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda personnel? So moved. Second. Dr. Luckett has moved. Mrs. Thompson has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 The motion carries. All right, board members, I do not believe there is any executive session. No, sir. So we'll take a motion to adjourn. I so move. Right. Mrs. Thompson has moved. Mr. Figures has seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Enthusiastic. The motion carries. Thank you, everyone, everybody. for everything this evening.
elementary and middle and high school and some other special schools that are attached to high schools here. Uh, we're just here to uh, talk to the community and parents about what we have going on at different schools. So next year we will have a middle college for our rising 11th graders. This is a partnership with Jackson Public Schools and Jackson State University where our students will have the opportunity to be duly enrolled and will be able to start beginning math courses that will lead to students becoming math educators with Jackson Public Schools. Montessori is multi-age classrooms and um, we teach using hands-on materials. So it's not the traditional desks and textbooks, it's everything is hands-on as you can see here on the table. We're excited about being here tonight. We're showcasing